Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. I am speaking to a very recognizable actress. If you don't know her, then you must have been living under a rock. She's been in pretty much, I don't even, I can't even rattle off everything in my head. So many different TV shows and so many different films. I'd like to welcome uh, Sarah Wiseman. How are you doing? Kia ora. I'm, I'm well, thank you. Thanks for having me. That's all right. So how's everything <laughs> going for you, given the, the uncertain times we are in? You know, um, I feel very blessed and very fortunate to be in Aotearoa with with our leadership currently underway. It feels, compared to, you know, as you look out on on the world news, I feel very uh, supported and safe. And the fact that we're kind of back up and running is extraordinary. So, um, yeah, I feel very grateful, actually, can, all things considered. Yeah. Do you have much work at the moment? I do, actually. Um Pretty much as soon as we could start working again, um, there was a couple of jobs, one that I'm, one that's wrapped, one that's still going, um, and just got another little gig today. And, um, yeah, so uh, and, and got work into early next year. So, yeah, feeling oh, pretty wow. blessed for that. Yeah. Was that stuff that you had to chase yourself or did it all just come to you? Oh, no, it's always the audition. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. You yeah, still have yeah. to audition? I thought everyone would be like, oh. Everyone knows Sarah. She's got the part already. Oh, uh, no, I don't, no, I, um, I don't know. I think it's, I know people over, I mean, I know Craig just got given an offer, um, but um, the, and offshore, I think there's a lot more offers, but usually in New Zealand, for the most part, it seems that you, yeah, it's, it's the usual audition route. Yeah. Yeah, is it just one audition you do, or do you have to go in for a number of auditions? No, you you do your initial one, whether it's a self tape or you go into the room with the casting director, and then depending on the size of the role and uh, the show, it, there's um, usually a recall as well, where you'll be in there potentially with the director um, when they get down to like two or three, maybe. Yeah. 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 Do you ever get nervous? Yeah. You, yeah, you still get nervous. Yeah. Even though you're yeah, especially still, if it, especially if it's a good one and it really matters, it's like yeah, yeah, don't get nervous. Really? So how do you yeah. how do you stop yourself from getting overwhelmed by the nerves? It's a, it's like it's an ongoing thing. I think so long as you feel like you're really prepared when you walk in and are ready to build it in the room and have a bit of a play. Um, and then I, the best thing, I mean, you've got that's the thing. We've got so much we can't control. So if you can leave the audition room feeling satisfied that you've you've given it everything you can and you've kind of like sprayed your dna everywhere and you can sort of walk away and go i i left nothing in the in the in the tank then it's then it's like well that's that's all i can do yeah fair enough so do you prefer to work on a film or a television series uh i don't really have uh, a preference it's usually always it just comes down to the project mm. it's a it's a script and a project and people that you're really inspired by. That's kind of the, the priority regardless of what, what size screen that it's turning up on yeah, or what, what stage you're walking on. Yeah. The reason why I ask is because I'd imagine with a television series is it's more guaranteed in terms of your paycheck as opposed to a film. So say when you're uh, okay. working on uh, like street legal or mercy peak, you know, you would know kind of how long you're Everyone's working. Everyone's done for. their homework. <laughs> <laughs> That's way back. That's way back. That's I thought way I'd, back. I, yeah, I thought I'd, I'd take it back because I remember like watching you as a kid, man. I, yeah, like, back in the day. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, remember Mercy those Peak's days. Mercy a highlight. That was a Mercy Peak was very special. That was back in the day of the golden era of working on film. Yeah. You know, shooting on film, and you could hear it ticking over, and that that precious between action, well, you know, turning over literally to cut they have those, that precious time where everyone's just so focused in on their job. It's, yeah, it's really wonderful show, that one. Has, has much changed in terms of how everything is filmed now from back in those days to now in terms of like a series? Or is it still think, yeah. traditionally the same and just better gear, I suppose? Well, it's, yeah, I think it's, it, I mean, the the whole routine's exactly the same. What is different is with data, with digital now, you can just gather so much more data. It's almost 
that 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 silence between turnover and cut you know production and crew could be still talking right up to action as they're still getting their themselves into position um so yeah there's because it's not you you know film's not running through the the can which is money running through the can um because it's data now there's a i guess there's a bit more relaxation around that process but still you know everyone's still lifting their game and it's really interesting with hd i I find hd interesting because when you look at the hd tvs now which carry so much pixelation it can take often make things look really documentary and quite like the magic dust has disappeared that film used to have so when when they do all the you know the edits and the and the the grading and post to make it look like that again however everyone's hd tvs still pull out every tiny ounce of detail that 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 softness can sometimes go yeah because it's it's almost hyper real isn't it yeah 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 Yeah. i think i i think when i watched i think the hobbit films because they were shot in 48 (laughs) frames per second and it looked super super real it was yeah it was jarring at first because you're so used to the traditional way of watching that filmic look. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was like, wow, I just feel like I'm watching sport (laughs) (laughs) because it's so clear. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. I I remember that feeling too, watching it. I was like, wow, I can, I can see the camera move as opposed to just the emotionality of being taken along a journey. It's yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So do you have a 1080p television or a 4k television? Uh, we've got an, it's, it's not flash. We don't have a smart TV, but it's still HD in that respect. Um, I guess you just get used to it, I suppose, but I do. I, I'm sure there's a setting that I could learn how to do to take it back to that, but I haven't done it. <laughs> reason yeah. why I ask, I'm, I'm wondering if you'd be able to tell the difference between a 1080p picture and a 4K picture, because it's, it's not actually that much different. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if... If I was given this is what this is and this is what this is, then maybe, but because I've never actually analysed that. No, I don't know. Yeah. So you used to be a stunt woman before. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. How was how was that? Like, I don't even know how you transitioned from a stunt woman to an actress. Was that always well, the plan? Well, um, I just when I. I just wanted to put when coming through customs, I wanted to be able to win occupation. I wanted to write stunt woman. So that was, that was the initial reason. Um, but I came from a dance background as opposed to martial arts background. And I knew the more that I was doing stunts, uh, I severely lacked that, um, that martial art training, which I feel is essential for those, especially a lot of those fight sequences and such. Um, but I had such a, such a great time. It was such a great way to learn, um, on set etiquette and, and being on a set and the professionalism and how the whole system works. So that was where I kind of got my onset training and then decided um, after a, a, an experience uh, volunteering on Peter Jackson's Heavenly Creatures behind the scenes and had to step in f- while he lined up a shot for Kate Winslet while she uh, had her finals. And I just felt like I'd been hit in the stomach I got, just got a suck punch. I was like, no, I want to be in front of the camera, not behind. And then immediately ran away from that because that was so daunting, the idea of – I didn't even know where to begin. I was that kid at primary school who um, would audition for Cinderella and get the mute servant that came on and bowed and left. <laughs> so there wasn't, wasn't much faith in my acting skills. Um, but, yeah, then from stunting, I just auditioned, did part-time classes and then auditioned for full-time – drama school and then three years later graduated and went into street legal wow yeah what a what an adventure eh? yeah 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 and you're on and you're on heavenly creatures and you got to double for kate winslet like well did you you, did you get to actually talk to her or did you meet her because you know how sometimes Yeah, yeah i met mel and kate um she was only like i think she was only 17 or something at the time just a young one this is like her first big film um, and she, I think she was very classy. She's very, just that UK Britishness that yeah, is very yeah. classy, even for a 17 year old, very worldly. 
Um, but that was an amazing experience volunteering on that because I worked on production art department, um, worked as a runner, I worked in unit. Um, so I got, got a deep respect for each of the, of the departments and how they run and, and what their function is. So yeah, t- like crews are the hardest, hardest working people. They're just incredible. They never get the time, you know, we get to go away and sit away for a scene or a day off or whatever, but they are there 24 seven. So yeah. Yeah. And I suppose they don't get the recognition that all the actors and actresses don't. Uh, no. do. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. And you know, obviously directors and cinematographers can sound special effects, get the recognition, but the first AD, the runner, the unit, manager the location scout that's there from 3 a.m till 9 p.m you know there's no awards for them but it, it, it wouldn't run without them so yeah so during your time on there did you foresee peter jackson becoming as big as he did because obviously this was way before lord of the rings yeah way before i love i think heavenly creatures is still one of my favorite films of his it was I remember being there that day doing lollipop traffic control <laughs> for the scene when they're in the bush where they, the two of them bludgeon the mother, Sarah Pierce. And I remember hearing it through the bush and I remember um, Kate being deeply upset on rap and him giving her this huge hug while she cried. And it was just, it was just an extraordinary sensation of, like like every component, every compartment comes together to make to make that magic, that that stuff that ends up on the screen. And I'm, you know, he was a visionary, he still is a visionary. And uh, I do wonder if he misses doing those independent little smaller ones. I think he would, because there'd be a lot of responsibility and a lot of stress. I'd imagine. I mean, I've seen oh, some of yeah. the behind the scenes footage with uh, Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, yeah. and it just. Yeah, it, it just looks giant. overwhelming. Yeah, absolute, absolute giant. And I mean, hats off to his production team that can just seamlessly put three, five units together, but and that he can sit there and watch five monitors running at the same time and check. That. It's just like there's a whole other level of brain activity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I always say there's no Lord of the Rings without heavenly creatures. I think that Absolutely. was that was brain the, dead. Yeah, or brain dead. Yeah. But I think Heavenly Creatures was the one that kind of put him on the mat that got him recognized in Hollywood so he yeah. could actually go to the studios yeah. and be like, hey, we can do this. Yeah, well, I mean, I had hats off to Al Bol, Alan Bollinger, because that was his, they were they were like the, the Scorsese, De Niro, obviously, you know, that, that tag team, the two of them, and Al Bol was so intrinsic in the, in the, in the how things were captured. So I, th- I thought they were just a wonderful duo duo together yeah yeah so what's what's coming up in terms of stuff that you're working on that you can talk about oh i well oh you can't I, say I don't, well i don't i don't know i mean that's the thing i, I, I don't want to get you in re- trouble no 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 i can talk about one that's that i've just wrapped on um with uh roseanne yang who's just won people audience award at Toronto with a walk in the clouds. She's um, created this outrageously, brilliantly wacky um, show for TVNZ and called Cremory and with her flat three production girls. And so I got a, got a, offered a um, fantastic role on that. It's one of the most fun roles I've ever had the opportunity to play. And in the character breakdown description for the audition was, um, the inspiration being Linda Hamilton from Terminator 2. Nice. So, so to get to do some really, really, um, and also, so that actually managed to bring in my stunt background as well and some of the scenes and stuff. So it was, it was kind of like coming full circle. So I'm really excited to see what happens with that show. It's very, very fresh. Okay. I'll yeah. keep an eye out for it. I did, I did watch uh, recently One Lane Bridge. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, me and my partner binge watched it. It's it's awesome. good. It's good. Yeah, it's it's you know it's so wonderful and it's so rare because money's so tight here to be able to be a hundred percent location. To, for example, the contrast. I was also doing the sounds um, at the same time and with the sounds, which is meant to be set Marlborough uh, Marlborough sounds. 
mostly being shot ex Auckland and then little satellite units going off to different places uh, because of cost. But with One Lane Bridge, um, they were adamant that to shoot at 100% in Queenstown. So to be able to work down there in the most gloriously beautiful part of the country and be with such a fantastic cast and crew and Pip Hall who wrote it, it's a very dear friend of mine, as, as is Pete Berger and um, who directed the first half of it. So it was just one of those gigs where you keep pinching yourself every time you wake up and sort of get up and get out there and get amongst it. Yeah, was Craig jealous? <laughs> he, he was. <laughs> he was. But you know, he was he was filming Head High at the time, so you know, he was he was doing just fine. <laughs> how how long was the shoot? How long uh, were you in Queenstown for? Approximately three months, although uh it was only Joel and Dominic who were down there full time. Um, our number one and our number two. And then the rest of us uh would fly up and down depending on our work days and yeah, but but I did end up spending a lot of time down there and reacquainted myself with the, the town and the hillside, so it was great. Yeah, it's very different from, say, Sydney or Auckland, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. Do you yeah. prefer Do you prefer Sydney or Auckland? I uh, am a Gemini, and I love both for very different reasons. Sydney is a magnificent city and have wonderful friends there. Um it's actually been interesting, you know, all the Instagram photos of friends putting their Sydney shots up and feeling the pang of having been able to get there. But um, yeah, I, it's such a, it's such a great city. Um, but I also love Auckland and our access to Coromandel and the beaches and our mates here. And it's just a lot easier to get around than Sydney, which is, you know, 4 million people in one city. Yeah. yeah it's very, very big. Yeah. Is the plan to go to Sydney once the borders open? Uh, well, um, it, it, yeah. So obviously when it's, when it's safe enough to go and you don't have to spend three K each way. Um, but I'm, I'm working here till April. So the plan was to be back for Christmas anyway. So the, the window is like November, December. So I might actually have to go back and get some summer clothes because they're all over there. <laughs> If, if that's if that's safe and able to be done, yeah, yeah. And you do you have done some voiceover work as well, haven't you? Yeah, I love voiceovers. Yeah, it's, it's great. What, I love being in like a studio like yours, and yeah, just and did so, one recently. Oh, and what was it for? Was it an advert, a game? Like, what was it? Uh, one, it was for once was like a um, something that won't be commercially seen. It's for the behind the scenes sort of introduction to a new company being the, the narrator voice of explaining that. And another one was actually reuniting with some, I used to do the voice for Westpac, Westpac before I went to Australia in 2011. So I was actually coming back together with that creative group and sound engineer, um, which was a surprise. I wasn't expecting it and um, doing, doing a campaign for another product here, mother earth. So it was, yeah, it was, it was just really nice to you get your little family, creative families. Yeah, because how, how long does it take to do one of those, a little voiceover? Well, they usually book the studio for an hour, and depending on how many uh, ads or copy there is to do, yeah, it can t sometimes take the full hour and sometimes a little 15 minutes, depending on how big it is. Because with voiceovers, do you have to over-enunciate? <laughs> Depends. It depends on the cell. Like some, like you, there's like the hard cell, which is the big shouty kind of ones uh, and a lot of information to get across. And then there's the one that I did with them, which was a lot more intimate and soft and just quietly speaking into the microphone to get a, a motor, a feeling rather than a, a the soft cell, I suppose. Yeah. And which, yeah. which one's easier? I, I prefer doing the soft cells. It just feels, I like the intimacy of that, talking to someone rather than barraging down the telly at them. <laughs> I think of like, I think of like a, uh, what is it? An auctioneer, you know, yeah. when they're yelling like, yeah. and they say it's super, super fast. And especially yeah. like or, the, the fine print stuff, like, yeah, edible and which, you know, you can, the sound engineer can like speed up sli slightly because there's so much they've got to get in, in that 15 seconds. But, but I, in, the, in saying that though, I do love, um, Oh, I'm trying to think from um, 
No, I won't go there. Anyway, the pack and save guy. But I know he's a wonderful presenter on, I want to say, Seven Days. But, yeah, oh, that's yes. a hard sell, but he makes it really fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I imagine so. I suppose in terms of pay, you'd probably get paid well concerning the amount of work you do on a voiceover compared to... It depends on the campaign. Okay. It depends on the campaign and it depends on if it's ongoing. Um, like some people are the, you know, have, uh, that's their regular gig that they're the Bunnings voice, they're the Might of 10 voice, you know, so there'll be countdown voice. So you're getting rollover every week on another, another price change on, or on something you can say, but, um, yeah, it depends on the campaign and if, and if they want to buy out your voice so that your voice won't be heard anywhere else, then obviously there'll be a retainer on that. Right. Like and the does, Briscoe's lady. Yes. The Briscoe's lady. And does your agent organize all that or does the agent only focus on getting you acting roles? No, no. With my agency at Johnson Laird, they have a voice department. So uh, they take care of that. But some people have their acting agent and their voiceover agent. Yeah. I did ask Craig this, but do you ever try and actively pursue a role? So you'll contact your agent and be like, I want this role. Get me um, a role in this. There's, I mean, if there's word out that there's something happening and you haven't, you haven't been contacted, then yeah, I'll reach out and go, is there anything suitable? Um, it's very rare that we'll have the opportunity to see a script prior to uh, being submitted. Although that has happened once where I heard about a, through another friend and I saw the, a character description, which I read and went, well, that's me. Why aren't I auditioning? And, um, and they wouldn't, and they didn't want to see me. So it's just like, that can be really frustrating. Did they say why? Uh, no. No? Yeah, that no. would be frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you don't have an answer, you don't get an answer. No, yeah. Yeah, but especially I spoke- when, I was fair enough if like I read the character description and it's like, well, like, okay, it's a reach. But this one I was like, well, that's me. <laughs> so yeah, that was like, oh, I don't have to go in, I'll just do a self-tape. I won't take up any of their time, but no, not interested. Do you find it easier to get work here or in Australia? <sighs> Um, I, well, the majority of my work's been here, but I've been here a lot longer. Um, yeah. the, the initial setup moving to Australia was quite challenging for the first year because over there, it's not a done deal that you will be, uh, allowed in the audition room because there's so many, um, actors over there and they've already got relationships with a lot of people. Um, it took a while before I could actually get into rooms, which is very frustrating, um, but then once, once I booked um, a place to call home and got the six seasons on that, that allowed me access to, I guess, a bit of credibility to be able to be seen for, for other roles, hence Between Two Worlds and Rake and so on. So did you and Craig both get cast in a place to call home at the same time? No, no. no. He, was, he was in episode one. Uh, my character is talked about, but doesn't actually enter until episode seven. So I auditioned halfway through their first season. All oh, right. Cause I did wonder, I'm like, did you audition? And then they just brought you in later. No, no, the, my character. Yeah. She, she was the black sheep of the family and she turns up halfway through. So with usually with that case, they'll audition all the initial characters. And then as each episode rolls out, the casting director will then focus on, each episode as it rolls out. Ah, oh, okay. Does Craig try and take credit for helping you get the role? <laughs> no, he doesn't. They didn't know that we were together. So oh, really? No, they had no idea until we had the table read of that block and um, that's when they realised that we knew each other and that we were actually married. Wow. That, that yeah. must have been funny. Yeah, yeah. Trying to it keep was, it undercover. It was really good. I'm really glad that they didn't know because... Sometimes that can be um, a strange thing for producers to wrap their head around sometimes. Yeah, but it must have been good shooting scenes with them. Would have been easy, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, no, we had a blast. It was, a, a, I mean, what a gift to be able to do six seasons. And, and yeah, we just had, had an amazing time and both loved our characters, um, 
and just wanted the best for for them and for the show and became very dear friends with the creator and just yeah it was just one of those I mean it's it's a show that's not for everyone it's melodrama and it's a period drama but um the cast and the crew and the whole uh experience was like one of those ones that you just you clock and go let's keep that one close yeah yeah how do you go about memorizing scripts? What's your process? Because <laughs> some of those scripts are big. And yeah, especially so, plays. Yeah, 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 plays or theater or mm. like a big television series. I mean, you're probably getting scripts week in, week out. Yeah, Shortland Street actors are the hardest ones in the country for sure. Hardest working, that is. Um, you just, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll record them and I'll leave a gap for where my line is and I'll record the other dialogue and then I'll just do repetition and then anchor certain words and visualize certain things and substitute if it's a, if it's a place or an object or a person that I, I have no connection to, then you can substitute to try and make it your own and then just repetition until, until it's in. Really? Some people are like got mates at who work at Shortland Street. Their ability to learn a script it, in such a short period of time, and that it's, it's such a wonderful skill and muscle memory to be able to do that. But yeah, I take a little longer. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. If I was doing Shortland Street, it would probably get better just with practice and just with doing it repeatedly. But yeah. Because how long were you on Shortland Street for? Only three months. Really? Mm. It felt like you were on for longer. No, three months. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's fast. And what's that? And it goes it's fast. fast. It's fast. Yeah. Days go real fast. Scenes go really fast. Yeah. That's why I take my hat off to those actors. Yeah. Cause do you, do you work well under pressure or do you, or do you crack? No, no, I actually like it. Yeah, it, you just have to you just have to hone in. Those we've only got five minutes to get the last scene, and we're running out of light, and it's no one's doing overtime. That kind of stuff. You just gotta just gotta lock and load. Really, that's actually a good skill because I'd I'd think under pressure you'd start questioning yourself mentally, be like, oh no, I have to get the shot. Oh no, oh no, because you know how sometimes if you think yeah. too much about something, you end up making a mistake. Yeah, you overthink. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, the pressure's there, but I mean, I've, I'm, I couldn't tell you how many times I've been in that situation of running out of light, five minutes left, we've only got one take at this, go. Happens it's, I, countless times, happens all the time. That's what you're up against. Yeah. Do you do, ever, ever do meditation or anything or anything to kind of... I have done, yeah. I've done um, Vipassana three times, which is a 10 day silent meditation retreat out in Kaukokpakopa. It's um, extraordinary. Not that I uh, ha haven't done it for a long time. Um, and my, my meditation should probably be a little more active than it is, but yeah, tend to do more of a, like a thrashy dance out. <laughs> a free form dance. <laughs> yeah. Gets rid of some extraneous energy and stress. So what the retreat, so what do you, what do you do for the 10 days? You don't just sit there, Medi do you? So it's, it adds up to 10 and a half hours of meditation a day. So you just sit and there for 10 hours? No, you have breaks. So you do little, you do your 4.30 to 6.30 session. Then you do your uh, eight till, I think there's two or three in the morning, two or three in the afternoon, then an evening uh, group meditation and there, there's a video discourse where the um, the person who developed it um, speaks to you it's a recorded recording explaining each day what you'll be doing the experiences you'll be having so it just sort of that's the instructional part of it and the rest of the time is silent meditation wow I really yeah. admire that because my partner's really into meditation and she tries to get me to do it and I'm about five minutes and I'm like I need yeah. something else because it's. Yeah. I, I just find it very hard to stay still. Mm. Mm. You should give it a go. <laughs> well, I've tried. I just uh, like go, no, go do the do the do the do the vipassana. It's and it's all it's all koha. It's uh, which is what I love about it. When you you pay as much as you think you can put towards it in terms of a donation to keep the place running, 
Um, and, and everyone that's working there is volunteering. So it's, it's a pretty good world set up and the, the grounds and the place are beautiful. Well, I imagine you can apply it a lot to acting, I suppose, yeah. if you're under pressure, if that's the case, yeah. so it must be very handy. Is there any particular scenes you find hard to shoot? Like love scenes, for example? <laughs> um, yeah, they're weird things. They're really weird things. But what's amazing now, I've trained with Etter O'Brien, who was the intimacy coordinator on shows like Normal People and Sex Education. Um, and what's wonderful now, because of, I guess, the Me Too campaign, is had some pretty uncomfortable situations with with filming intimate scenes because there was no choreography or no clear direction. And I think because the directors were probably feeling as awkward about it as the actors were, and because there was no clear dialogue, it can make it very a very icky experience for a lot of people. But now with the way with coordinators coming into, just like a stunt coordinator coming in to choreograph with the director, a sex scene or a whatever scene, um, then the actors feel safe in how they can handle each other. Um, they know where what's going to happen and then they can just forget about the awkwardness of it and just get on with it. So that's, I think, a massive shift that's happened in the last couple of years. Because I would imagine that would be very hard to prepare yourself mentally for. Like if you go through drama school, like how would how would you even prepare for when that time comes? You know, you get you end yeah. up on a show. So, like, oh yeah, you're going to do a sex scene, and yeah, well, I teach not- at the Actors Program with that with the course that I co-founded, and we have a very specific week just on the actors working up and getting comfortable with have you know simulated sex or whether it's consensual or non-consensual. Um, and all the stuff and the intimacy that comes with that. So when they are on set, it's not going to be, okay, I've never done this before. At least they've got an experience of what I can ask for, what should be expected um, and how, how I can take care of myself and my partner within that scene. Right. So when that happens though, is there like a camera set up and is it set up like how it would in an actual scene with a director and just a whole bunch of people standing there watching the scene? No, you, if they can, and the best case scenario is it's rehearsed prior to <clears throat> and the coordinator and the director will be there. And if they can't be in the space where it's going to be happening, at least the director can go, okay, so let's imagine this is where you are. This is where the window is. I'm going to be shooting it from here. I'm going to be shooting only mid shots. So then at least the actors can go, right. There's not, there's not a part of me that I don't want to be seen suddenly going, oh, sorry. You know, so it's up to the director to have a very clear vision about how they want to film those scenes as well. So then everyone's on the same page that when you go to that, because it is, it takes a lot more time to get those scenes usually. If they're that prepared, then when they do the block in the space, when the, the DP comes in, the sound comes in, they can work out where they're going to have to set their cameras and their microphones and stuff to, to make sure that, the shots are covered and they're not going to get in the way of the, the performance itself. So how long do those scenes usually take to shoot? Oh, how long's a piece of string? Depends on the, how long the event is like and where they are, if it's exterior, if it's interior, um, how long the intimacy goes for. Does it just, is it just a, you know, is it just the kiss or does it go all the way through or is it a, is it a group of people involved? It's just a, yeah, it's just a, yeah. So are you aware beforehand? So let's say if you're going to do a sex scene, do they tell you beforehand, okay, we're going to be doing it for six days? Or is it just like, well, we'll just see how long it takes? Oh, no, you'll know. You'll get it. <clears throat> you'll get the schedule. So the first day, day will have scheduled it in and you'll know from your advanced schedule just how long it's going to take in terms of supposedly it's going to take in terms of time blocks. Right. So what was the longest one that you ever worked on? <clears throat> Uh, maybe half a day. Okay. That's not too bad. Yeah. But you know, I think it was, I heard that meet Joe Black with Brad Pitt and the company. I think they, that was a five day shoot of them having sex five days. 
<laughs> and I saw that scene and it wasn't very good. So yeah, well, maybe, maybe it was what... the way it was edited. I don't know. <laughs> Five days though. So yeah. I'd imagine those scenes would be really <laughs> bad if you didn't get on well with your acting partner. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that thing of, it's nice to have a bit of natural chemistry with the person that you're going to be doing that with. And if you don't feel, I mean, that's what's so important about that coordinator is if you don't feel safe with that person for whatever reason, at least that gives you the opportunity to, to find safety within the choreography of it. Yeah. I suppose that makes sense. Mm. Now, is there any type of series or film genre that you haven't done that you'd be keen to do? Like what's something you'd really want to do that you haven't done? Cause you've been like in everything. So I'm trying to think if there's anything that you're like, <laughs> hmm. um, uh, yeah, I mean, I've got a, a few ideas. It's actually one that I've got an option agreement on that I've written. Um, um, that's a, that's a big, that's a big on the bucket list for me. But um, for me, it's, it's, I don't think it's just, it's not a certain thing. It's actually just having the opportunity when you see great writing and a great team, creative team coming together. That's what's, that's, that excites me. Yeah. Cause it now, as I, the older I get and the longer I do this, it's the, the joy comes from the creating on the day because you, you can be so let down by what you see on the end product um, because that's all the stuff that you can't control or how it's received. Um, you've got no control over that. So the only control that you do have is, is that joyous experience of being on set or on the boards, working it up. And th that's where I find my bliss now is, is within that creative team and, and coming together and creating something. Everyone's trying to do their best job. You know, no one's trying to be a dick and everyone's just trying to put their best foot forward. So I love that. That's what I love. Do you think you'd become a director at some point, like a full on director? Um, I teach. Uh, so I, I love the process of um, watching a, a, a person expand in their life force and have these big, wonderful, magical moments of connection. Um, having worked with so many directors I would never say never, but I know in terms of the level of craft, like I'm, I would love working with actors, but the technical side, that's where my, or yeah, I, I'd need a really wonderful cinematographer alongside me to be able to create, you know, beautiful shots and interesting shots and things like that. Yeah. Do you, do you find it weird seeing yourself on screen? Like, yeah. can you watch yourself on screen and be like, oh, this is weird? Yeah. Or, or All the are you ever like, oh my gosh, I was so awesome in that. Look at that. I look amazing. <laughs> no, no, that never happens. No, that no, I find happens? it very Yeah, I find it very uncomfortable watching. But you or have just, to get over that and see that if it's hopefully the performance is getting across. Or you just leave it to Craig to say that. Just be, <laughs> be like, hey. No, he deals with my he deals with my angst on a lot of things. So yeah. 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 I did I did ask him uh when I spoke to him, whether you guys would kind of take the piss out of each other on set. Cause we, we talked a little bit about ad libbing. Right. Mm. And, and so, you know, you, you might be following a script, but then um, you'll just chuck in like a random line or something that throws the person off. Did you, did you ever do that much with them? On, well, with, with a lot of productions, I, I mean, that's what I love about, I guess like educators, which I'm such a fan of, they don't have a script. They have a, a basic premise of where the scene's going to go and the beats that it, they have to get through, but then they are just free to improvise. And I think I'm, I love that. However, with a place to go home and Shortland street and, um, you know, every other, like with Creamery and, um, sounds and all that, it's, it's a, you have to really honor the writer's words unless you've got permission from the director to go, you know what you say, how you, you say it, how you'd want to say it, which happens as well. But I don't usually add superfluous kind of 
things. Uh, yeah. So you uh, do you find it easier to follow the stri- uh, script or sometimes are you like, man, I really want to improvise right now? Um, I, no, I don't know, actually. I, in our little scene group kind of exercise things, I love improvising because I think there's the freedom there. But I'm also hyper aware of uh, if I faff around too much, um, then I could be jeopardizing another scene later in the day that doesn't have time. You know, that when you're thinking about that, that bigger picture of, is this, is this just for me or am I really going to serve the story and serve everyone by changing it up? And sometimes, you know, you can, you can change your behavior or you can change your action um, within beats to give it a spark. And that's a wonderful thing in auditions as well, doing that. Um, but also if the, if the focus puller camera assist isn't ready for that and you're out of focus, then it's not captured anyway. And so it's a, you've, you've upset them because then they look like they've, they haven't been able to capture it, but then we're ready for it. So yeah, it's, it, I feel like it's team effort on a lot of that. Hmm. How easy is it for you to seamlessly, well, can you do it seamlessly, shift between accents? I suppose particularly in your case because you work in Australia as well, can you shift quite easily from the Kiwi to the Australian accent? If, um, if I've done it a little bit beforehand, if I haven't done it for a while, um, I can become self-conscious with it. But I've been, if I've been jamming around different ones, uh, yeah, usually all right. Don't ask me to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask him, like, when you go to Australia and you're hanging around with your Australian friends, do you just put on an Aussie accent to take the piss? Because yeah, no, Craig, no, 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 Craig no, does. No, actually, when, when, I, when I live over there, I tend to sound Australian. Is that intentional or that just naturally happens? Um, it's a bit of both. I have a, have, I have, I don't know if it's a, if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I can often end up mimicking what's around me. Unfortunately, I've done that with people with impediments quite out of, with no intention of being nasty or anything. I'll, I'll just slip into their, into their impediment. Um, but, but usually if I'm, if I'm in Australia, and I'm doing Australian work, it's just easier to stay with the Australian vowels. And then I feel comfortable rather than feel like when I'm going on set that I'm putting on an accent. It's just, it just is seamless. Just makes it easier. Mm. So how do you prepare for a role? Do you do a lot of research or are you like a method actor, Daniel Day Lewis styles? Uh, No, I'm not method. Um, But I do... Uh, yeah, do all that research and do all the imagineering around the script to make sure that I um, connect with it. I'll look at if there's other, it depends on what well, it should hopefully will be in the script, but also the director might have ideas and music's also a really wonderful way to create a soundtrack for that character. Um, and then, and, and then it's, I guess it's, if you feel like you've fully prepared and you've, you've got all that, then it's about, I know when I'm in a character, when I start thinking their thoughts. So when I start, when I'm not going, Sass is having the thought, it's, it's a, for example, with um, Place to Go Home, if I'm having Carolyn thoughts and stuff. So I love that feeling that now I'm, I'm inside her headspace. Yeah. Mm. Cause you worked on that show for six years. So when mm. the time came where you finished, were you able to disconnect from Carolyn or did it take you a while or many months before you? Oh, well, you know, you disconnect. Out of the character. It's, sweet. it's really, I mean, then you see it roll out, you see it play out on screen. So it burst back up again, but she was, uh, her, because when you live with, I guess it's the same with people who are long-term on Shortland street or any long-term character, long, uh, multiple season character, they, they become very real. And that woman was, and from the feedback that I got from a lot of fans who reached out, she reminded them of her aunt or her this or themselves and stuff. So they become very real. And Carolyn was very real for me. Mm. You're quite well known. So I have to ask, do you still have anonymity? Can I think you so. go, yeah, you can still go mm-hmm. places and people don't stop you. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't know whether they know me or not, but they don't necessarily come up. Yeah. Especially yeah. In, well, especially in Auckland, people tend to just leave you alone. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't think Kiwis worship celebrities the way some countries do. Like, you know, don't, how to... don't worship Kiwis. Don't worship Kiwi celebrities. Unless they're all blacks. <laughs> yes, yes. But Kiwis definitely worship off, offshore celebrities. Have you, have you ever been with an off, um, offshore celebrity and they just get uh, mobbed? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's – um, yeah, yeah. And they're very polite about it, which is, yeah, is a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Would you want to be that famous? Oh, if it came with an amazing paycheck? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's yeah. pretty much it, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you're getting, I, if you're getting, if you're getting that, that, that coin, that, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> then you'd be willing to take it. Yeah. <laughs> then you just like deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause then you can afford to go and isolate yourself somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So when the whole lockdown thing happened, were you in Australia or were you here? You know, when they announced I, the whole lockdown. Yeah, I was in filming in uh, Queensland, filming a show called Harrow up there. And we only had six days left to shoot. I myself had, I think, two or three days left to shoot. Um, and then, as we know, it, overnight, everything just flipped. Yeah. And uh, they, the lead actor um, stopped and my work was with him. So that meant, oh, well, I shouldn't be here. And I was on the next, the next plane out the next day to, to New Zealand, got here six days before Alert 4 locked in. Wow, that's pretty good timing. Yeah, yeah. Because you could have been stuck there. Yeah, well, that was the nightmare of the idea of, Craig being here and me being in Sydney for who knows how long. Um, but yeah, no, it worked out really well to be able to fly across and, and get in time for, for the five weeks of lockdown. How did you survive lockdown? Loved it. You loved it? Craig didn't yeah. drive you insane? No, we actually, it was like a, it was like a reuniting. Cause we spent so much time apart with our work, different countries, different towns. So, the great thing about it was because no one was working, no one was auditioning. There was no FOMO. It wasn't like, what, what's happening out there? Because no one was working. It was like, ah, oh, everyone's doing exactly what I'm doing. And it just took, it just meant you could really relax and, yeah. and, just, and just drop in. Yeah. Okay. So you found that quite easy to do to just, just well, shift into relaxing mode. And, well, it wasn't, I mean, I had a lot of projects wrote a script, you know, did lots of things, went through bouts of, uh, was, you know, a roller coaster like it was for everyone. Some days were really good. Some days you were drinking by 10. Some days you were running like four hours of exercise. Some, you know, it was like the whole spectrum was well and truly covered, <laughs> but, but to be, I felt very safe and very supported, um, in this country. So yeah, what wasn't looking at America and going, Oh my gosh, thank goodness. We're not having to deal with that. Yeah. Cause are you introverted or extroverted? Both. Oh, that's even better. Mm. So you can shift. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'm quite extroverted. So that's, I found right. lockdown very hard. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have lots of zoom meetings with people? No, well, I wasn't doing any zoom, uh, podcast at that stage i took the yeah. time to try and learn some new skills like i learned coding and a few other things as well see see there you go productive yeah, yeah I, was, I tried to be productive otherwise i'd go insane yeah yeah well there was a lot i got quite zoom fried a lot of you know zoom parties and stuff but it was actually really nice to have um quite in-depth considered conversations with people because that was your only focus as opposed to 50 people in a room and what level of conversation do you get to when it's like that? Yeah. So how long would you spend on your Zoom meetings? Like hours? Some of them were, some of them were long. Some yeah. of them involved costume changes. Yep. That was a, that was a good one. 
Um, yeah, it was, it, it, it depends. The early ones I think started longer and then I just got, it's quite tiring doing the Zoom things as you probably know. So yeah, at, at one point it's like, I can't actually concentrate anymore. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Because are you a morning person, uh, person or a, or a night person? Um, both, but both. I love it how it's, you're both with everything. It's just like the perfect. Both. Sometimes, balance. sometimes morning on, and then sometimes night. <laughs> yeah. Because I imagine with some of those uh, television series and even with films, you have to start really, really early. Yep. Yeah, I think my early, earliest alarm I had was two fifty. Wow. Okay. And then did yeah, you have to commute from your house or wherever you're staying to the, to the set? Yeah. Yeah. But fortunately with, uh, with a place called home, um, I, we had runners pick us up with drivers. So it wasn't oh, my wow. responsibility to make sure I got there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, it made it, it made it really good. That's living the life. That's the yeah. dream. Yeah, and really lovely people too, you know, they're up way before you are to get to you and then drop you off and then get home. So hard working. Yeah. Yeah. But was it hard when that all stopped and you're like, oh, I have to do everything myself again? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I've got a, oh, what do you mean I don't get a lunch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's an interesting one because people feel in terms of right now with elections and budgets and stuff, usually the first thing to be cut is the arts funding because it's seen as extraneous. But if people then went, all right, so no arts. All right. Well then you take away all your music, you take away all your Spotify, you take all your pictures off the wall, you take away all your books, you take away your podcast, you take away, all of that and you you know your netflix and stuff and then suddenly there's a realization just how important story and culture is and how important we are in showing our identity out there so yeah definitely agree have you run into politicians i mean you've been in the game a while and i'm sure politicians know who you are it's like oh my god she's amazing so like do they have you ever um come into contact with them Mm mm-hmm yeah. And yeah. you're like, Hey, yeah. support the arts. Well, fortunately the, uh, the politician that I know does, um, and she is a huge advocate for it for those reasons and understands it's how beneficial it is. So, yeah. And then, you know, I, I yeah, it's, I, and I support her back. So, yeah. Yeah. That's good. It would be yeah. a bit weird, wouldn't it, if if you knew a politician and they didn't support the arts and you were good friends with them? It would be sh- weird, I'm sure. Probably why we're not friends. <laughs> the other ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably why. Probably why. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, hey, I think I'm going to wrap up there. It's great. This has been amazing. It's good to finally talk to you because, like, yeah, I've watched you for years. I was trying. Like I was it. like, I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna freak out. I'm not gonna get starstruck or anything, but. I didn't, so I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I, I'm grounded. I'm grounded. <laughs> but hey, I look forward to seeing you in more amazing things. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, if anyone wants to follow you on social media, I see you're quite active on Instagram. Yeah, I, I jumped off the Twitter. I just found it too um, vile. Oh. Everyone, everyone on Twitter is nasty. And I just, I thought, you know what, it was my new source, but I don't need to hear all those personal insults. So I will stick with just nice pictures. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know a lot of people that don't use Twitter. I mean, I don't really use Twitter. I kind of just use it because I have to, to market yeah, it. But it's, yeah. but I, I find if, even with Facebook, actually, if I'm on there too much, then um, it starts to affect me mentally because yeah. you're just absorbing yeah negative shit like all the time yeah yeah and i know i've 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 spewed out my fair share of of complaining especially around politics but um but yeah but i i guess it's that it's that double-edged sword isn't it with social media is that you can have wonderful stuff come out which can uplift you and then other stuff which can 
just strip you of your soul. <laughs> so all about balance. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen that Netflix show, The Social Dilemma? No, I haven't. It's it's pretty scary stuff because it's... I saw The Great Hack and that terrified me. Yeah, well, this is yeah. just as bad probably. These are all the people that kind of created those social media platforms. Right. What their original intentions were and how... Basically, how social media rewires your brain and how they subconsciously get into your brain to make you need things or want things that you didn't even know that you needed or wanted. Like advertising. Yeah, but well, it is well, it is advertising. Yeah, yeah, it is advertising. Yeah. But I think it's um worse in some in some way. Yeah, I I think back to imagine if we could, you know, having grown up in a world where there was no social media, the idea of of suddenly overnight all social media was no no more. I think everyone would just take a big sigh of relief. <laughs> And actually go, there'd be that moment of panic of, wait, what? I can't connect. And then it'd be, oh, here I am. Oh, look at, look at that. And that's all that matters. And I don't have to worry about what anyone else is doing. I think that's great for us because we, you know, we grew up in a time where it didn't exist. But I yeah. do worry for kids and the youth because they don't know anything different, right? No. So. And so all that likability value, I mean, that's why Black Mirror is so extraordinary, that that, that series of just showing how how affected we could be in our psychosis in terms of looking at looking for external validity for ourselves yeah yeah for sure well hey all the best well, hey um we we sorry what's 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 your um instagram name oh, you know what sarah wiseman Is i it? think it's i think it's sarah wiseman and then it's like two underscore underscore i think I think that's that's the only one I could get. Yeah, well, I am following you, so I'll find out what it is and I'll put it in the description and YouTube and Spotify and all that jazz. But thanks again. You are a legend. Aww. And I, I hope you, um, yeah, I, I continue to see you in great things. Thanks, Reese. Really that's appreciate right. the chat. It's good to have a good old yarn. Yeah, yeah, I enjoy it. That's, that's the main reason why I do this. So yeah. that's good. Cool. cool, that's the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. Uh, subscribe subscribe and support this amazing woman uh yeah and stay safe